So the only culture where you would be able to get a wide use of horses uh, would be a culture where food for the horses, forage, grass, is virtually free, or at least so cheap that it's not a problem, because horses are not very productive agriculturally. They just you could just run with them. That's all. Needless to say, modern harnesses changed all that, but they didn't have modern harnesses, so that's a different. Uh, no reason to mention that. So each culture seems to ad adopt uh, horses as a way to deal with the military invasions of people using horses. So they had to step up their own technology to meet this, or they started using horses militarily, you know, for their own benefit, rather than to answer someone who's attacking them. They just adopt the use of them because it's wise. So um, uh, if the horse in the ancient world is a Ferrari that goes fast. Uh, but it's useless and expensive, then the ox is a tractor that goes very, very slowly, but it's productive for agriculture. And uh, if you can get a culture where you don't have to plow or anything, where there's just free food, then you can drive Ferraris around everywhere. And uh, a nation mounted on Ferraris would be a fearsome military po well, Let's say a nation mounted on four-wheel drive Ferraris, Hummers or something. Yeah. It's falling apart, but you get the idea. Uh, we skip down a bit, and here's a quote uh, taken from uh, Man and Culture uh, by Thomas Y. Crowell. I believe, oh no, Thomas Y. Crowell Company. I don't know who wrote the book. It's called Man and Culture, but here's the quote. The horse was a different thing to the wild nomad, on the one hand, and the Egyptian, or civilized man, on the other. To the Egyptian he was a mere fighting machine, and so but a military incident in Egyptian life. But to the nomad, the horse was as much a part of the individual life as his master's boots. From what glimpses we have of the ancient nomad life, it seems that everybody rode all the time. In fact, lived on horseback. I don't know about that. It's been said that Indians could sleep while riding and stuff. <laughs> Um, hence the nomad, uh, hence for the nomad to fight as cavalry was the natural or the only way. For the truth of the matter is that his whole life was adjusted to the horse rather than to fighting. When, so he, if a horse is his way of life, then when it comes to fighting, he's got to use the horse. Rather than using the horse to fight, he uses the horse, period, and, then you, and has to use it to fight because that's all he uses. Uh, <clears throat> so when he moved about, he rode. When he indulged in sport, he rode. When he met with danger, the chances are that he was mounted. You know, he, he rides all the time. And that quote continuing from the book now. To put the matter briefly, there arose in Europe two traditions of horsemanship or horse culture. The one, that of the settled people with whom horses were, but one of the incidents of life. And the other, the tradition of the nomadic people to whom horses were vital. Now, uh, pause for a second there. On the Mongol, Mong the, with the Mongols on the steps, there are, there's a horse culture. They drink the milk of the horses. They eat the flesh of the horses, because they didn't have that passage from the Bible against eating a cloven hoof, so they, they weren't afraid of that. Uh, they live in, in houses made out of horse um, and, and hide. They wear clothing made out of horse hide. Um, so horses can give you just about everything you need if you haven't read the Bible and you aren't afraid of eating horse meat. Uh, so both of these traditions, uh, the military tradition and the total way of life tradition, uh, found their way to America and each found its appropriate environment. The English colonies used the horse uh, more as a way of life um, on an on a incidental level rather than a total way of life that it consumes everything. Um, you had to have horses, say, to get from one city to the next or whatever, but that, that's about all they were good for, whereas out on the plains it did develop a nomad culture. Uh, so we saw the old patterns of the old world repeat. No surprise. And he contrasts here the culture of the woodlands with the culture of the plains and says, quote, Certain it is that the plains environment exists throughout much of Spain, North Africa, Arabia, and in the steppes of Asia, where man and horses first became associated as masters and servants. So there you go. Even in Spain, so the Spanish were familiar with the, the ways of life of nomadism, or potentially uh, could have used 
that they understood vast open spaces that had to be uh, uh, gotten across. So, it is a well-known fact that the Spanish explorers brought horses to America in considerable numbers. At the time of their coming, no Spaniard would have thought of going on a warlike expedition without horses. They had been fighting the Moors who had come across North Africa and up into um, Spain across the Straits of Gibraltar. They've been fighting them for a long time. They're familiar with this. And where did the Mongols, or pardon me, where did the uh, Muslims get their horses? The Mongols. So here we see from the steppes of Asia a chain of command, chain of, of historical cause and effect that uh, goes all the way down across Africa up into Spain and then jumps from there to North America. And yet, as you probably know, uh, the voyage of Columbus in 1492 came right on the heels of the final defeat of the Moors. Uh, Columbus had asked the Spanish crown to uh, grant him a ship or two ships or something to make this voyage. They said, no, we're busy with uh, this war. They won a historic victory uh, against the Moors, the final great victory that kicked them off of the Iberian Peninsula. And they actually sent a rider after Columbus to try to tell him, hey, come back, let's make a deal. We finished this military situation. We're willing to look at some, some projects now. So, they had just barely finished with the fight uh, against the Muslims when they commissioned some ships to head to America. Quote, the student of social origins and institutions would like to put his finger on the exact spot where the Spanish explorers, uh, horses, mares and stallions, for gelding was not then practiced. Now, I don't know what that means. I guess gelding is, is um, neuter or something. I don't know. Uh, they broke their tethers and rushed away into the wild country. We would like to find where that first happened. It may not have happened like then. They may not have broke their tethers, metaphorically speaking. Let's continue. Perhaps the horses were stampeded by Indians or by herds of buffalo. But it is more than likely that some were set free because they became too poor or foot sore or crippled to be of further use to their masters. It is not remarkable that horses escaped but it is remarkable that they survived. Multiply it and spread over the region west of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. Is it? I have to pause there. I don't think so. I think that's a no-brainer. You've got this vast open plains with some rivers here and there and uh, endless quantities of food and no natural predators. It was coyotes or something, you know, so a small horse foal might have to watch out, but um, on the whole, horses on the Great Plains didn't have natural uh, predators to, to worry about. They would have been near the top of the, uh, basically the top of the food pyramid. So, why would they? Why? Why would it be remarkable that they survived? Let's continue, though. Not only did they spread as beasts of burden for the Plains Indians, but they grew wild in vast herds, pro proving that they had found a natural home. Again, it's not remarkable. It's astonishing or something. Interesting, not remarkable. It is generally accepted by anthropologists that these herds originated from the horses lost or abandoned by De Soto around 1541. Whether they came from De Soto's horses or from those of Coronado or from other explorers is not material. We know that the Kiowa and Missouri Indians were mounted by 1682. The Pawnee by 1700. The Comanche, 1714, the Plains Cree, the Arikara by 1738, it keeps going, the Teton, 1742. How much earlier these Indians rode horses, we do not know. But we can say that the dispersion of horses, which began in 1541, was completed over the Plains area by 1784. So just about the time of the establishment of the United States of America, you had horses everywhere in the West, from, from Oregon and California down to Florida and Mississippi. So uh, it, it was complete by the time we had signed the Constitution, and it was you know another 20 or 30 years before we started pushing out in that direction. So uh, this dispersion proceeded from south to north and occurred in the 17th and 18th centuries. At the time, horse culture spread in the region east of the Mississippi and west of the Rocky Mountains, but in both cases it was restricted, never developing to any extent north of Virginia 